My next guest has been an MP since 2010, part of the rush that dethroned Labour. He's been a columnist, an analyst, and acclaimed author. Then seven years after becoming an MP, he got his foot on the first rung of government office. Once he was in, he rose fast, and quite rightly, ending up as Chancellor of the Exchequer under Liz Truss, before it all came crashing down. I look forward to spending more time in my constituency and continuing to serve South West Norfolk from the back benches. Our country continues to battle through a storm. But I believe in Britain. I believe in the British people. And I know that brighter days lie ahead. Thank you. So, Kwasi, I'm going to talk about those hours in a moment. But what did you think of Matt's performance at the COVID inquiry? Matt yesterday? Hancock? Yeah. I thought he was Was honest. there another Matt there yesterday? No, no, no. I was just <laughs> making sure that we're talking about the same uh, person that we know well. I think he's in a really difficult position because whatever he does, whatever he did, whatever he said, he'd get hammered. I yeah. mean, it was, a, it was an unprecedented situation. There was no rule book. There was no playbook to follow. And the decisions were taken in real time. And they were difficult decisions. Mm. And I think what he said was... You know, he, he thinks the, the lockdown should have happened earlier. Now, that's controversial. Mm. Um, but, of course, he was being driven... And we can't prove it. And there's no modelling that will exactly. back that up. No, there isn't. And there's no counterfactual universe where everything was done differently, where everything is better. Mm. You know, we were in the real time and we had to make decisions. But I think his point about Dominic Cummings was quite interesting. Mm. Um, clearly, there was a lot of tension between what Matt was trying to do in the department and what Dominic was doing in Number 10. That was interesting. Yeah. Um, but I think he came across as someone who, who wanted to get to the truth. Yeah, and, and, and yeah, I agree. And I know people, it's quite interesting point that Matt said, people have been saying, oh, Matt's a liar. And, you know, there may have been things that he went into number 10, into sure. Cobra with that weren't wholly right. Sure. That's not the same as being someone who tells lies. That's right. They may That's not right. have been wholly right because the advice that he was given That's right. I mean, you, wholly I right. I mean, this is what I like coming on your show because you've actually been there. And you know that once you go into the cabinet room, there are lots of different bits of paper. Yeah. And some of the information is, isn't necessarily right. And you have to make a decision which bits you exactly. think are right. And you it, have to go with your gut and go, right, that seems to be... Exactly doesn't right. mean, though, that, that you're you going to be... you were lying. Yeah. So, so to call Matt a liar was absolutely wrong. No, I think, I think you're quite right about that. And the tensions, the toxicity in number 10. Well, of course, I've written about that in my book recently. Yes, you have. Um, which is... which. Um, I've started it. Have I've you? given it lots of... Uh, <laughs> bought quite a few for Christmas. Good. Various people. Good, keep it up. <laughs> so there's... Um, so obviously, and I talk about a lot of this toxicity, and it was pretty bad. Mm. And the whole issue of um, Dominic Cummings believing that he actually was the Prime Minister, yes. taking decisions which he didn't form the Prime Minister he'd taken, right. stopping Secretaries of State from passing information up to the Prime Minister. Yeah. I mean, it was an utterly bizarre way for Number 10 to run. And he was a malign, bad actor. And then, you know, on top of that, you had, I said in my introduction, Michael Gove has been Dominic Cummings' sponsor and well, they're close. patron. They're because, close. Well, he first employed him in 2002 and he worked with Michael Gove wherever he went. Yeah, that's right. So that's they're right. more than close. He's been absolutely <laughs> at Michael's side for 25 for years. A long time. A long time. And uh, what I saw in the department was a lot of turf grabbing. Now, you know this, it happens when you're a Secretary of State. People will come and they'll try to take bits of your department that's off right. you. Uh, what I saw and witnessed was a battle between, you know, and it was talked about a lot by civil servants and officials in the department, Michael Gove's department trying to constantly take yes. some of the health. Now, yes. he phrased it yesterday as, you know, there was too much going into the health department. That's kind of like his laying down the, he's right. the kind of the groundwork for what's going to come up. But it was, there was just not enough people focusing on what we were trying to do. Too many people focusing, I want to be the one in front of the cameras. I want to be in the front of history. That. Huge amount of and, that. And actually, the turf wars, I mean, that's Whitehall is full of that. Oh, that's in my department. That's in your department. That's in my... They cherry-pick all the nice bits. Yeah. And there are certain sections of state, I mean, you mentioned one, I think, who are notorious for that. They're always trying to grab other people, you know, bits of other people's uh, pie, as it were. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's an element... But that's, I think, an element of, of politics, when you're, especially when you're in that high-pressure environment. You've got lots of egos. And people want to claim the, the, the limelight. And it's really, really a bad idea, but that's what that's human nature in many it ways. Is, it is, but when you're facing a pandemic and actually when you're democratically accountable, I think that's when that has to be... I agree, it has adapted. to be held in check. So tell me about your time, Quasi. I know I've asked you this Fascinating. Uh, look, so I had, what, three years in Cabinet, really enjoyed 
uh, being Secretary of State. I love sitting opposite you. And it was fun. We had a yeah, good time. And Boris was a great Prime Minister in that he allowed Secretary of State to do their job. He wasn't trying to micromanage everything from the centre, generally. And he trusted people to get on with it. And that was a very encouraging, very nurturing environment. I think when I became Chancellor, obviously, you know, the PM Liz wanted to get things done very, very quickly. There was a real pressure to, to, to get things moving. We could see what the problem was, and it's still there. We don't have enough growth in the economy. And you don't have to be a genius to work out. If your public spending is going up at 5% and your economy is roughly growing at 0% or 1%, you've got a big problem there. You've got to either borrow money... Coming or down the tracks, that you? Yeah, and it's, it's still there. So, but that was very high pressure. I mean, I enjoyed it. I enjoy uh, the responsibility. I enjoyed, you know, being at the, you know, the centre of things. But, of course, it's high pressure. And, you know, in the end, the markets and, and the political situation was such that she sacked me, and I was amazed. I just thought, well, you've just killed yourself. So There's no way you're going to survive this. One of the, one of the turning points, one of the key moments, was on that Monday morning when the Asian markets and the Sunday night completely offloaded sterling. Mm. Why did that happen? So there was lots of things going on. It was partly in response to the mini-budget, but there was also the fact that the interest rates in the, the US had gone up. So it wasn't just sterling. Obviously, we look at what's going on in the pound. The yen hit a 50-year low, and the euro hit an all-time low. And the dollar happened to be very strong. Actually, when it, as it transpired over a couple of weeks, sterling recovered a bit, but it was what was happening in the gilt market. That's what undid us. Mm. And the Bank of England said, look, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna basically cover this uh, until the 14th of October. Uh, but on Monday morning, uh, uh, we're not going to basically give any more support to the gilt market. And that's what caused the panic. Because basically, the Prime Minister thought, on Monday morning, when the markets open, that we're not going to be able to borrow any money. There'll be a, a rush on guilt. There'll be a, a sell-off of guilt. And it'll be a disaster. So I have to do something. This is her thinking. I have to do something before that happens. And that's essentially why I was summoned back and sacked. But I could see that as soon as that happened, she was dead. Mm. There was no way she was going to survive. I said maybe three weeks. In the end, it was six days. But I, I knew that essentially... You, it was just like watching somebody commit political suicide. Mm. And I could see that that was going to happen. And, and she felt she couldn't, she couldn't do anything else. Do you feel hard done by? Do you um, feel like you were treated badly? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I was disappointed with what, went, what happened. Because obviously, if you've got... And someone... You were talking about Boris. You know, once you had his backing, you had it, his backing. In a way, he was too much the other way. People say he was too loyal. Mm. But, you know, once you'd agreed a plan of action, I thought we should have just tried to see it through a bit longer. And, it, and it, you know, so someone said to me, it's like being thrown under the bus and then the person being run over by the next bus. It, it's just disappointing. Yeah. Um, and I, I feel that... But anyway, I mean, you know... But can you explain to me, because I know a lot of people ask me this question, where we are now with interest rates right now mm. and inflation where it is right now, which, you know, it does kind of, like, peeve me slightly that Sunak's claiming... Because yeah, so, yeah. we know it's falling across the world and that's particularly right, across right. Europe. But explain to me, what is different between now... And then? So I think the only difference, really, was that because we were in such a rush, we didn't explain what we were trying to do. It just sort of happened, and markets were spooked. The situation, fundamentally, is almost exactly the same. It's almost exactly so the same. It's the same, but Sunak just the, rides and, it through yeah, and, and Hunter's still and, there. And the, yeah, but and, nothing's and, changed. But they haven't spooked anyone. That's You've the thing. gone, Liz has gone, but nothing's changed. No, I, don't think any, I think the fundamentals are, are as bad as they were last year. And the only difference is that it's obvious to me what the growth plan is. I mean, I know Jeremy's, you know, tentatively trying to do something. The autumn statement was, was OK. I mean, I wrote about it. But to fundamentally change our country, we're going to have to get growth back. We're going to have to grow the economy at 2 2.5%. And it seems to me that we're not, we're, we're not there yet. We don't even have an idea to get there. Because I'm going to come to our panelists, but you as you said, without the growth, you don't have the money. There are you going to be money. serious cuts That's in exactly public right. spending. Whether we do them, whether Labour gets in and does them, serious well, exactly cuts are coming. Right. Exactly. I mean, you, you just can't get out of it. Unless you grow the economy, you cannot provide the public services that we all want to see. Yeah. So, Zoe, what do you have to say about that? Well, Particularly about the fact that with no growth, there will be serious cuts in public spending. 
That really concerns me because currently public services are in such dire straits. I mean, we literally have schools and hospitals almost falling down. Um, Jeremy Hunt said he found this amount of money that would basically fund tax cuts, but completely ignoring the fact that there are these absolute necessities in public services, these, this need for spending that has just been totally ignored. Growth is one thing, but I find it quite jarring to hear politicians talk about growth in this way without thinking about the real impact that Kwasi's budget had on, on many people across the country. You know, it's, all, it's very well to say we should have ridden it out and see what happened, but so many people were suffering the immediate impact of that. You know, the impact it had on the housing market, we're still feeling yeah, now. Yeah, but, but Zoe, that impact wasn't down solely to Kwasi's no, budget. No, that was rate, down to yeah, Putin right. invading Ukraine, to energy prices okay. soaring, yes, but and to Labour a pandemic. Picked on it, okay. But actually, the, what, the thing with the interest rates is the Bank of England, the bank rate was at 0.1%, and now it's at 52 for Five percent. I'm not so anyone who's, of course anyone who's remortgaged factors. is going is going to get hammered. Of course, there are external factors, but you can't deny the fact that the budget did have an impact. I said, I've said that. I've yeah, said that we rushed course. it. I've, and, I've been very clear about that. And my point, and I've been is, on peers and said the same. And my point is that I just find it it doesn't tally with most working people's um, experience in this country of what that period was like. It wasn't the case that many people could just wait it out and see what happened. People but you know, Zoe, I think it's one of those situations, again, where it's just not black and white. It is quite complex. Mm. And a lot of people don't understand. You know, it, my own kids didn't, you know, understand what the full impact of what was happening. What was at play? Because the media, actually, and this is one of the issues which was interpreted by the media, the media wrote it up and played it out as this is all down to this budget, mm. this mini mm. budget. Well, in fact, it wasn't solely down there to There were the lots of budget. things going on. Yes. And, I've, and I think people should accept the responsibility, as I have done many times, because I think it was rushed and we had that debate. But at the same time, there was a huge macro sort of picture. And more than a year later, a lot of the problems are still there. And you say, oh, well, I hate it when politicians, didn't like it when politicians talk about growth. Growth is everything. Growth is about your ability to get a job, our kids' abilities to get jobs, right, our abilities to... Unemployment to, figures staying up. Well, I, unemployment I figures will start to rise. In yeah, it sounds, without it sounds abstract, but, but, but basically, the only way we're going to pay for public services, for pensions, for the NHS, is if we can make the, grow the economy faster. That's the only way we can actually provide for the, the sort of public services we Some need. of us are actually old enough to remember when employment ran at almost 3 million, when public mm -hmm. spending was slashed to the bone, when there was no growth in the economy and inflation was out of control. They are days I never want to see and go back to again. Madeline. Well, I, I, I always think of that budget as a, a, a terrible missed opportunity because I worried for a long time that thereafter any mention of tax cuts, any mention of even of growth as being a big priority would be kind of tarnished by association. Um, and I, I think actually there were lots of external circumstances and landmines that sort of happened to flare up at exactly the same time. But I'm not sure that fully excuses it. So, for example, Liz Truss was someone who was Chief Secretary of the Treasury for ages. You know, she might have been more alert than most to, for example, the turbulence in the UK pensions industry and the risk... Nobody knew about that. I mean, she said that clearly. Nobody knew, yeah. essentially, that the, those, those, those pension funds had borrowed to the extent they had. In, in those particular that was assets. Yeah. That yeah, was yeah, definitely yeah. a shock. There was no, yeah. no, no, but we no way... But we knew there was a war in Ukraine, and you knew that we, there we was knew, We knew about other things, but actually what, tippled, what, what tipped over the gun wasn't the yeah, pound, it was the, the, pension, fund it was the pension funds, and it was what, the gilts yeah. and the interest rates. Yeah. And that, it was that relationship there, that There really was an element of bad luck, but I think when you, when you go at it in such a very... It was to, I, I've said that a million times. Oh, yeah, of course. It was way too fast, and I get the fact that the markets were spooked. Yeah. I totally understand that. But it's important that the Conservative Party don't dispense with everything that, that Liz Truss was saying, because that point about growth is very, very important. It is everything. Unfortunately, successive Conservative governments have often not prioritised that. For example, often being very obstructive of any kind of building mm. um, and all the, the, the obstacles that stand in the way of building, infrastructure, housing. This is impoverishing us and it will continue to do so. And it's actually, it makes me sad that I often hear Keir Starmer talking a better game on this kind of thing than I do the, the Conservative It's funny, party. actually. He talks about growth. He and Rachel Reeves yeah. mention growth a lot she more. She sounds like a yeah. Conservative. A lot more than chancer. we do. They a do. Lot, a lot more than they say we need to... Yeah. Because they get it. We've got to... I mean, we have no money, so you have to find ways of yeah, bringing and, positive change and, without... And they, they do not want to be a Labour government that comes in after so long out in the cold to come in and have to impose public spending cuts because that will make them a very short-term Labour government. That's the last thing they want to do. But it's difficult for them because in order to pay for the public services, 
they're going to have to put up taxes. Mm -hmm. I can't see a way beyond that. Uh, yeah, and, and I, that won't make the pop or borrow. I, and I, but I think maybe it's a matter yeah. of reframing the conversation. I, I, I think Madeline's correct. I think we talk about growth, we talk about productivity. We have a country where there just simply aren't enough houses, they're simply, the transport network doesn't work. All these things mean that various parts of the UK cannot grow. So the housing issue, I think you've hit the nail on the head. And I remember, you know, I was, I mean, um, Nadine mentioned my career. I was PBS to Philip Hammond about seven years ago when he was chancellor. And we had this very conversation mm -hmm. about housing. But of course the bill that came for, we, we didn't have a majority. Well, see, I've got, to, yeah. I've got to go to break, but every chancellor and everybody who works in, in the Treasury has this conversation about housing. Having been there 25 <laughs> years, it's perennial, and we still don't build enough houses. Coming up after the break, Kwasi and my panel will be back with me, and we will talk about this. Is it a brutal message for Rishi Sunak? The king wears a Greek flag to COP28, following a diplomatic row over the Parthenon marbles. Hello, I'm Nadine Dorries and welcome back to Friday Night with Nadine. There's something we must talk about tonight and that's King Charles' attire at COP28 today. The King was spotted at the summit wearing a tie displaying the Greek flag. This comes after a diplomatic pantomime this week with Rishi Sunak cancelling a meeting with the Greek Prime Minister just in case he brought up the Parthenon marbles, known to most of us as the Elgin marbles. This looks like the king doing his best to clean up Sunak's mess, which could have very easily have been avoided. So I want to get the opinion of um, Kwasi, because I know you're a bit of a classicist and you're into this kind of thing. Yeah. I think it's time for us. I changed my position from when I was Secretary of State. I think it's time for us to now and I agree with George Osborne. Yeah, you know, you never thought I'd say that. No, no, I didn't think that. <laughs> it's time to send those marbles back on on a, on a lone rotate, rotating basis, which is the way we can do it we'll within the back. law. And and but on a rotating basis, you know, one lot comes back, another lot sure. goes out, and that the Greeks meet half of the cost of doing so. I think I think it, it seems obvious to me that that's where we're getting to. My own view. I started off with the view that we should keep them because I think he essentially Me saved too. them. I think if Lord Elgin hadn't bought them and transported them from Greece to London, they, they, wouldn't, be, they wouldn't be there. They would, they, would have, they would have disappeared. But having said that, clearly it's not going to go as, away as an issue. I think, the, you know, I think the museum has to actually decide. Because yeah. according to the law, of course, we yeah. decide. But I think the museum <laughs> needs a bit more autonomy. Yeah. And I think the kind of sharing or loan arrangement uh, is probably the way to go. It is. So a quick two-word opinion. Um, Zoe, do you think they should go back to Greece? I think they should go back to Greece. Madeleine? I think it would open up a can of worms. I think it has to be very carefully a one-off issue and not become the default for I, objects I around it, the world. Because actually everything in the British Museum yes, is taken. started exactly, off somewhere else. Exactly. <laughs> and this, this, oh, oh, and I know this only too well, having had this on my desk when yeah, I was you, Secretary I mean, of State. It, yeah. it was kind of like, OK, well, if we send the, the Elgin marbles back, where yeah, does it stop? Exactly, what else exactly. do we send back? But, but you know, if, global, we had, global, if they yeah. had our heritage in a bunch of stones and marbles, we would be relentless in wanting them back. Mm. And I understand how for their tourism industry, for their, their sense of pride, for it is that. their history, it's their heritage. Well, you say that, but a lot of stuff, I mean, you would have seen this, you know, gets sold to the US. I mean, so much of our heritage is in the United States. Yeah. You know, antiques, all sorts yeah, of yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. people it's buy them It's slightly different though, isn't it? You know, the Parthenon? I agree. And agree. the Acropolis yeah. are quite special and quite uh, different. No, I, this, of course this I take is, This is, you're right, it is different. And actually, I. I would like to see them back in, in Athens, but I do worry that it will get wrapped up in all the arguments around restitution, etc. It has to be seen as a kind of one-off, almost like a unilateral friendship, a sure. gift, because it's so important to Greece. It, it's yeah. not the default, and this is not something that we owe them legally. They belong to us. This, the whole diplomatic process, which yeah. can evolve from this, Greek is our friend. Greece is our friend, becoming our better friend. It was very the old. Yes. It was very it's old. It's bizarre what he's done. It but was you know, very old. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, his whole pitch is that he's a grown-up who's now going to build alliances with the EU and build alliances around the world. So it was yes. odd. I thought it was very odd. I think that he, he was trying to move the media dialogue, wasn't he? I don't know what he meant. I do. I think the fact that um, the king has worn the Greek tie today <laughs> is called, like, okay, I've got to step in. I've got to step up to the plate. I've got to show some diplomacy towards our friends in Greece. I think it should 
done that. It was just rude. It's bad. That's a political message. He's a constitutional monarch. It's not. Oh no, I think he did. I'm the he, queen. But the the, the queen hat. would never have done no, it. No, the queen. Would she wore a purple ne- hat with gold stars, with gold studs on it, which looked like the EU flag. I, I don't know. <laughs> I think there was plausible deniability there. Definitely not with this. Okay. Not with well, this. none of us here have lost our marbles, and that brings us to the end of tonight's show. 